Hi, I'm Eric Hall, the digital sports editor at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and I'm joined by Lisa Wilson of The Athletic, who was APSC president in 2020-2021. Uh, thanks for joining me, Lisa. Thanks, Eric. Um, so how did you get involved with APSC? So when I became sports editor at the Buffalo News in 2011, Michael Anastasi called me and reached out to me. APSC was in Boston that year. And prior to that, you know, I knew a little bit about APSC. You know, it was a, I knew it was a place where my boss would go and sometimes come back with a couple of plaques. But that was really about it. I didn't know too much about the organization, honestly, before I uh, moved into that role of sports editor. So Michael called me and asked me would I be willing to come to Boston to the conference. And I told him, sure. And honestly, I expected to go there, you know, probably be bored, say hi to a few people, you know, and go because I was invited. So I wanted to take him up on the invitation. And, you know, here I am 12 years later, still very active <laughs> in the group and haven't been president. So um, it was certainly worth coming to Boston. I'm so glad he called me to um, come and join the organization. Yeah. What are some members of that, that Boston convention? Um, how great it was to be in a room with people who were very welcoming and had such great advice for you, even if you didn't go up to them and ask. Um, and it's something that I've tried to do, you know, as I've gone through the years of APSC, when I meet new editors, kind of talk to them and find out what they're doing and uh, give them as much career advice as I can, because I didn't ask for it. But, you know, people were kind of just telling me, oh, you're a new sports editor. Um, you know, telling me some things that they had learned in their career, some advice for me. And, of course, it's where I met one of my uh, greatest mentors in Gary D. Howard. Uh, so those are the memories of that Boston conference. That's great. Uh, how did you ascend to then become president of the organization? <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I might be the only president, uh, past president you're talking to who you actually nominated to be president. Uh, I remember that was 2017. It was one of the few judgings I didn't attend because it was the year I left the Buffalo News to go to the undefeated. So I was moving from Buffalo to the D.C. area, so I just couldn't make it down that year. And I remember you and Larry Graham called me and said that, you know, uh, nominations were up for second vice president. Would I consider running? And I said yes. And honestly, it's something, you know, I was active in the group. You know, it kind of crossed my mind. Maybe one day I want to run for leadership. But it's interesting when people see things in you that maybe you don't see in yourself, that gets you thinking, okay, maybe I can do this. If you hadn't called and nominated me, who knows if I would have been thinking about it. But if you and Larry, who have been really active in this organization, saw something in me and thought that I could lead the group, you know, I was more than willing to take a chance and run and see what would happen. And then by winning second VP, it kind of confirmed that others in the organization saw me as a leader as well. And that's that's everything when people see things in you. It kind of gives you the confidence to know that you can do the job and to kind of push forward. Yeah, I was definitely excited when you said yes, because I wasn't sure whether uh, you would <laughs> right. say yes. And then when you got elected, that was exciting to see. It was, yeah. Because, you know, so... You know, some people turn down the nominations for time constraints or whatever, but, you know, I thought it was something I'd have the time to do, and you kind of gave me that push to actually do and run for leadership, so thank you. Well, I'm glad. Uh, what are you most proud of from your time serving as president? Well, <laughs> um, my nickname was the pandemic president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, right when I was ascending to the presidency was uh, COVID and shutdown, and the summer conference was canceled. I'm the only president and hopefully will always be the only president to give my opening speech on Zoom. So it was a, a strange year. But what I wanted to accomplish that year was to kind of get the organization through that as best we could and come out on the other side. So obviously we couldn't meet. We couldn't have any region meetings in person. I had to cancel the winter conference. But I tried to do as much virtually as I could. So we had a virtual winter conference. Somehow we navigated all remote judging for the first time, and Gary Potosky and the other officers were really huge in getting us through that. So really proud we were able to get the contest done because we didn't, we'd never done it fully remotely. So we learned that, okay, we can get the contest done. Obviously, it took a lot longer than we thought. We kind of called it the never-ending contest, but it got done. And I'm really proud that we were able to do that. You know, we weren't able to meet personally in the regions, but we had some region check-ins. I just wanted to kind of make sure that the organization stayed relative during that, I'm sorry, relevant during that time because 
you know, that was a strange time. Everyone was just trying to get through it and kind of get used to the new way of doing things. You know, sports is shut down. So, you know, tried to make sure we stayed together as a group as much as we could, that we were there for each other, for advice of how we were getting through, trying to navigate, you know, sports for that period, you know, um, access the way it was, you know, at the time. So very proud of that, that I was able to get the organization through that strange COVID year and finish with an in-person conference, which I did not think was going to happen. But um, being able to push that back in Glen Crevier deserves so much credit for being able to get that conference moved from June to August. This is right when vaccines were um, coming out and we said, okay, if we can get enough people vaccinated, we might be able to have this in person. So being able to do that and give my closing speech in person um, was very important to me. And I was very proud that I was able to just kind of get us through that year and kind of set us up for returning to normal and growing the organization even more. Um, two other things that Sam really proud of was getting the electric report done, our um, gender and racial report card. We had gone usually two years apart, but 2018 was the last time we did it. And because of the pandemic, like everything kind of slowed down and shut down, we were kind of behind schedule. So it really should have come out in 2020. I was leaving office in 2021 and I wanted to make sure it was done to kind of get us back on schedule. So I was able to do that. You know, it took a lot of uh, emailing and staying in touch with our ORP members to kind of make sure, hey, do the survey. It's always a tough thing. You know, people don't want to fill that out sometimes because maybe their diversity isn't where they want it to be. Um, but I try to convince people that it's okay if it isn't where it wants to be because we're being judged as a group and it's very important that we see how we're doing and that we try to do better. And if you don't fill out the survey, we're really not going to know where we are or if we've been better since the last time we did that. So I was really proud to get that done and also extremely proud that Gary D. Howard, who I just talked about as my mentor, that we were able to get another scholarship for APSE that honored Gary and benefited an HBCU student. And that was key with Phil Kaplan. When I called Phil to kind of talk about the fact that I wanted to name a scholarship after Gary, Phil had been thinking the same thing, which was really interesting. So we were able to, you know, plan that and uh, get Gary on a Zoom. We had to trick Gary. I told him I didn't want him to talk to some of our student chapters. And so he got on and it was just the two of us at first. And then Phil comes on, and I was wondering if he was going to figure out exactly what we were doing. Um, he didn't. He's like, hey, Phil. And then we told him what we were doing, and it brought him to tears, which was really great, you know, to see. So uh, those are a few of the things that I'm proud of during my presidency. Yeah, that's that's quite an impressive list. Thank you. Um, you talked about it a little bit. But can you elaborate more on what went on behind the scenes to get that 2021 convention to happen in oh Vegas? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's. Glenn, it's really Glenn was so key for a lot of these things. Uh, you know, we had to cancel Indy in 2020 when I was taking over. Um, and Glenn had to work with the hotel to get that moved to 2022. That was last year. Yeah, yeah so he had to work to get that moved. Um, the winter conference, we had to cancel that. So we were able to get that moved. We had a three-year commitment, so he was able to get that moved. So we were able to get that without penalty. And then we were wondering, could we possibly swing a third conference to either cancel or move without having, because, you know, if you book a hotel and you don't go through with it, obviously there's a huge penalty and, you know, the um, state of the industry and, you know, finances being what they were, there was no way we wanted to have to, like, eat that and have to pay a huge penalty on that. So Glenn being able to move that was huge. So it was a lot of really working with the hotel and, you know, weeks if we were able to move the conference it was going to require a return trip this year and that's why we're going back to Vegas Glenn was so key in getting all that done um so I really have to give him so much credit you know if I'm going to start naming how that happened Glenn would be at the top of that list and then from there it's the other officers who were just kind of planning things and trying to figure out how we do things and you know it was tough right like should we be doing this? Because as as the months were going on, every other organization and ABJ, awesome, you know, they were canceling or doing virtual. So it's like, should we do this? Are we being irresponsible by doing this? We had to worry about that. But, you know, as time went on and people were being vaxxed, we said, we can probably do this and do everything we can to try to keep it as safe as we can for our members. And I think we were able to do that. That was the year where we just, if you remember, we had just all general sessions. Yeah. We didn't have the repeat workshops that we do every year. So 
So we get into a room, spread out, do it once. Uh, that was one way we tried to do it. Hospitality would have been a bad idea yeah. that year, so we decided not to have hospitality that year. So just a lot of planning of trying to get this done and try to do it as safely as we can uh, was a lot of what went into that. Yeah. Speaking of conferences, like, are there any other memories or highlights from other conferences that stick out to you from, from your time attending APSE? You know, I wouldn't say there's a particular conference, but what I enjoy most about these conferences is when I get to meet new people. And there's so many people I've met over the years through APSC, you know, relationships that have developed both personally and professionally that really sticks out. What really sticks out for all APSC conferences is just kind of the camaraderie, you know, and the fellowship that you get here. Um, what does APSC meant to you professionally? Oh my gosh, everything, everything. Um, it's part of why I've moved on to other jobs. You know, when I became sports editor of the Undefeated, that's through contacts I made here. Um, the Athletic, I actually talked to Paul Fichtenbaum in Nashville at an APSC conference and moved from the Undefeated to the Athletic where I am now. That's all through APSC. Um, as a young editor, when I started to come and come every year, um, it meant a lot that people kind of got to know me, remembered some of the work I did, and just to have people come up to you you know, you're always hoping you're doing a good job. Yeah. Um, but feedback is so important, you know, like if you get that from your boss, if you get that from the people who work for you, if you get that from your peers, it means a lot. And it especially means a lot from your peers. So I would have Joe Sullivan for the Boston Globe, you know, great section. You know, um, I remember one time, I can't remember, maybe it was Chicago, the Chicago conference might have been the second conference um, that I came to. And the news won a couple of awards, and Mike James from the LA Times came up to me and said, "Oh, didn't you win three last year?" And that means, you know, for a young editor like the LA Times sports yeah. editor, remembered that you won some stuff last yeah. year and tells you, "Great job!" Wow. So not only did that help me kind of grow as a professional, as far as the things you learn here in each session, you always take something away from all the sessions of the summer conference, or if you come to judging, reading stories, as you know, you get so many ideas, you just kind of learn what good writing is as you're doing this. So not only did that help, it's just the confidence boost I think I got from APSC it meant so much to me professionally. And that's because people took the time to get to know me and tell me, hey, you're doing a great job. What are some of the personal relationships that have meant the most to you that you've made through APSC? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Like I said, um, before I came to APSC, you know, I had mentors, you know, throughout my career. But really, having Gary, Gary was the mentor that really, he'd tell me I was doing a good job, but he would also tell me when I wasn't. Yeah. And that's what you need. You know, you need a mentor who's going to praise you, but also kick you in the butt. And that was Gary. Anybody who knows Gary would know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, that he's the best mentor you can have. So, yeah, that's professional, but it's also personal yeah. because he's a mentor, but he's also a very good friend, yeah. you know, and I've met so many friends through APSC, um, other women, as you know, you know, there aren't as many of us in this industry as there should be, um, other journalists of color, you know, there aren't as many as us who should be. And, you know, I've helped develop those relationships through other groups as well, but also through APSC. It just means a lot. You know, people reach out to me when things have happened in my life. And that's, you know, it's meant a lot to me personally, just because of the friendships I've made here. I think anyone who stays in APSC and attends conferences um, always leaves here with a new friend. And so that's been really great for me. What advice would you have for future presidents of APSC? If I was going to give advice for future APSC presidents, um, one thing I did before I became president is I called past presidents and kind of ask for advice yeah. because you really don't know. You can kind of have an idea. I mean, you've seen presidents leading the meetings and doing some of the things. You kind of know some of what's involved, but there's a lot that you don't know that's involved. So I called past presidents to say, what advice would you give me taking over? And I learned a lot of different things that have kind of got me ready to do the job. That's one thing. I'd say reach out to as many past presidents as you can just to kind of find out what they did. You know, not only did I find out what they did well, some folks were telling me things they would have done different if they'd known. So that was kind of good to be armed with that information going into it. I'd also recommend that presidents set 
a few attainable goals that you can do when you're APSC president, you want to do everything and change everything, you know, and you, that year goes by like that. It really does. So try to set a few goals that you want to accomplish. Try to figure out what kind of legacy you want to lead and work towards that. You can't change everything in an organization that's been around this long in a year, but you can do enough to make your mark on it. That's the one thing I recommend. I'd also hope that presidents coming will stay involved in the organization because, you know, there's some things I wanted to accomplish that I probably didn't get to, but I said, wait a minute, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay in APSC. You know, I'm going to be involved in APSC. You know, I'm going to come to judging. I'm going to work on committees, you know, and I ended up taking over the career development committee, you know, so a lot of what I was started when I was president trying to, you know, connect more with the student chapters and do all that. We got a really good start on that. You know, we started doing the, um, the Zooms with the students to kind of get them more. A lot of them have been active among themselves, but I don't think they came together much or was involved with the national as much as they could have been. And that's one of the things I tried to accomplish during my presidency. But there's a lot more we can do with student yeah. chapters. And I can't get that all done in a year. Yeah. But if I stick around and stay on these committees and work with the students, you know, eventually I think we can get to where we want to be. Yeah. So just because I'm not president anymore doesn't mean that I can't work towards some of the things that I wanted to do when I was president and continue that and do that to make the organization better. And some past presidents are still around. You see, you know, I'm not the only one. You see John Bednarowski. You see Tommy Dees, you know, what he does with sponsorship. Um, Bill Kaplan, what he does with the scholarships. Um, and that's just to name a couple. And then there's some past presidents, unfortunately, you just don't see anymore. And that's for whatever reason. They switch jobs or, or whatever, you know. But if you can stay involved with the organization, I think it's so worth it past your presidency. And that's why I'm still here. I'm going to continue to be here. Another thing I'd recommend is to start thinking about your presidency well before you're taking over. Because one of the things I tried to do as first VP was kind of talk to people in the organization and say, you know, how's everything going for you with APSC? What might you want to see? You know, what would you change? What do you like? What's some of the things you change? Those conversations are so important to kind of start working on that well before you actually take over. Yeah. And I didn't do that as when I was second VP because we kind of had these um, roles that we take on. The second vice president runs a website. The first vice president is really consumed with the contest and it's a time suck. You know, then you take over as president and you get moving, and like I said, that year's over. But start thinking and working towards some of your presidential goals, because you have three-year term as an uh, officer. Start working on some of that when you're second VP, and you won't feel that you have to get so much accomplished in a year if you kind of start early. So that's just a few yeah. things that I kind of took away from my presidency that I'd share with any presidents coming behind me. Yeah. Um, what are you doing now in your career, uh, a couple years after the presidency? And, and as far as what I'm doing for yeah. APSC? Oh, no, uh, for with the athletic and when you're Oh, so yeah, I'm in, so now I'm in, uh, I, when I came to the athletic in 2018, I was the NFL managing editor, and now I'm an editorial director, and my groups include the NFL, so I'm so glad to still be involved with the NFL, um, our culture vertical, our college basketball group, our new opinion vertical, and the universal desk okay. are all part of my groups. Is there anything else you want to add about your experience with APSC or any other fond memories? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's so many. There's so many. But again, this business is so much about relationships professionally, but also personally. And just, you know, I wouldn't trade the relationships that APSC brought about for me for anything. Um, it's just meant so much to me for my career and personally. And you, I mean, I'm not just saying this because you're giving me the interview, you know, you're a really good friend, you know, and you are a huge reason why I became president because you said, hey, I think she'd be a good choice to be a leader. And that was everything, you know, so that's, if you see something in someone, let them know because that could be, you know, the boost they need to go ahead and, and do what you think they can do. Well, thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. I'm glad we ever do this in person. Yeah, for sure. Probably wasn't looking at the camera. No. But